Howdy. Howdy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Cameron Forum featuring UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. We are delighted that the Secretary General can join us here tonight, given his busy schedule, and I'm sure we're all in for a treat. But before we start, I have a few announcements I'd like to make. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge our new president here at Texas A&M University, Dr. Elsa Morano, is with us tonight. We also have a hundred special guests in the adjoining um, auditorium of watching clo via closed TV. Those are candidates for the Bush School, and we're very proud that these students are considering the Bush School. We are ranked number 35 in the nation of among 260 schools, so we are growing in importance. <laughs> We also have the Bush Library Advisory Council with us today. They come on a yearly basis, and we're pleased to see them. You know, they're the bunch of people that come tell us what to do and then leave. <laughs> but seriously, thank you for being with us here tonight. Uh, one uh, more announcement I'd like to make is uh, this evening would not be possible without the support and generous support, I should add, of Mrs. Flo Creighton, who endowed this program in memory of her father. And I'm delighted that she is here with us tonight. Flo, thank you. As I mentioned earlier, we do have an overflow crowd in the adjoining auditorium. Um, after the program is uh, finished, um, the president and the secretary general will be going to the adjoining auditorium. So I ask those people there to please remain seated because you will have a visit from the president and the secretary general. Uh, the secretary general will speak for approximately 20 to 25 minutes, after which he will take some questions. And I believe you were given index cards as you were coming in and you had the opportunity to write down a question. So those were the questions that uh, will be addressed to the Secretary General. So we're in for a very, very special treat, and it's my pleasure at this time, ladies and gentlemen, to call upon the 41st President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming President George Bush. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Presidente, please, thank you. Bless you, bless you. Thank you for that warm welcome. And uh, thank you for joining us for another fascinating evening here at the Bush Library. I'm so pleased to see our new Aggie president here. She's doing a great job already. And we have all, all of respect in the world for her. And I'm glad that she got introduced a minute ago. She's sitting next to Andy Card, her former secretary and also the uh, uh, former chief of staff for President 43, and uh, we're delighted that he's here with us today. Um, we've been fortunate through the years to have a series of distinguished leaders come here and share their thoughts about our world and the critical challenges that we face. Tonight is certainly no exception, as we welcome a truly distinguished global figure and diplomat to Texas A&M and the Bush Library. Few senior ranking UN officials have come into this important demanding job better prepared or with greater respect from their peers. Ban Ki-moon has served in many capacities within the co Korean government and I've seen him in several of those capacities when I've been fortunate enough to visit uh, Korea and when he came to the White House. Uh, he's helped to guide that truly amazing country, which I will again be visiting in a week or so, on the uh, guiding him on a greater prosperity uh, and a path to peace. Throughout his career, he's gained a breadth of experience, both literally and figuratively, from New Delhi to New Vienna to Washington, from national security to trade and finance, to his role in the critical peace negotiations on the Korean Peninsula, and now to one of the most important dip dip diplomatic posts on the planet. As someone who once served in and maintained a respect for the United Nations, I'm happy to assert my view that the Secretary General has already had a positive impact on this organization, recently launching new initiatives with respect to violence against women, the environment, and showing great wisdom 
The Secretary General did what President Clinton and I did with our Hurricane Katrina effort. We both called upon George Clooney uh, to, to uh, help with, in his instance, to help with the tragedy in Darfur. Uh, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure, genuine pleasure, to welcome a friend, to welcome this distinguished diplomat to the Bush Library, the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> President Bush and Madame Rora Bush, uh, Barbara Bush, <laughs> thank you very much for your kind introduction. Chancellor Michael McKinley and uh, Dr. Elsa Murano, a new president. Uh, Mrs. Flo uh, uh, Critton, uh, distinguished members of the Houston Consular Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, howdy. howdy. <laughs> it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be with you tonight. It's good to be here in Texas my first visit as Secretary General of the United Nations to this Lone Star State of Texas. It's a particular honor uh, to be with you at the George Bush Presidential Library. I've always admired this great American president, a great foreign policy president, and a longtime friend of the United Nations, and also the Republic of Korea, my own country. As you all know, he served as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. He was the man whose good judgment and diplomatic skill served the world so well when the Berlin Wall came down and Germany was reunited, creating the Europe of today. What you might not know is that when he was serving as Vice President of this great country under President Ronald Reagan, he had an alter ego. When I was a mid-career graduate student at the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, in 1984, we conducted a mock National Security Council where I chaired and acted as Vice President George Bush. <laughs> at that time, I was the real power, in fact. Let me mention also something which you might not know again. When the President Bush and Madame Bush uh, visited Korea after retirement from uh, presidency, he, they came to Korea, and I was a vice foreign minister, of course, representing the Republic of Korean government. I went to the airport to greet them among so many, uh, so many people who really wanted to uh, greet them. And I really wanted to help them to bring their luggage. Then President Bush said, look, minister, this is my baggage, so uh, <laughs> I will carry. <laughs> President Bush and Madame Bush, they carried their luggage themselves. This is unheard of in Korea, normally. <laughs> From there, I saw this as a major of the man, modest, decent, down to earth, and unaffected by power. This story I have been telling to many people uh, since 2000, and that much I have had a deep admiration and respect, not only for his great uh, political leadership, but for his very down to earth personal uh, lifestyle. Tonight, this is a family affair. Last October, some of you may have heard uh, Jenna Bush speak here about her experience working with AIDS, AIDS patient for UNICEF in Latin America. Her cousin, Roran, helps raise money for the UN World Food Program, 
which last year fed 70 million people in 80 countries around the world. The United Nations has no better friend than the United, United States. According to opinion polls, three quarters of Americans believe the United Nations should play a larger role in the, in the world. Most Americans want U.S. foreign policy to be conducted in partnership with the United Nations. Why? Because working together is in the best interest of the United States, and it is in the best interest of the United Nations, and the best interest for the whole world. As a boy growing up in South Korea, right after Korean War, I was inspired by America and by its noble ideals. American soldiers, American people, saved my country from communist aggression. They were so friendly, so, so generous, and they sacrificed so much. I'm still uh, grateful uh, for the sacrifice the American people uh, made for my country. As Secretary General, I appreciate more than ever the importance of working together with the United States. The United States needs the United Nations, the world's only truly universal institution. And the UN needs the United, United States to reach our shared objectives. United States and United Nations have shared goals and objectives. Let's begin with the situation in Darfur, which he just mentioned. A few years ago, not many people have heard of this dusty corner of Africa. Today, Americans are calling for action to end the conflict that has claimed more than 200,000 lives and 2.2 million refugees. President Bush, 43, has been a leader in this campaign, and we are working together. We are about to deploy 26,000 peacekeepers to Darfur, the largest mission in the history of the United Nations. You can imagine how tough it will be. You've heard of the Janjaweed militia. You've heard about the killings, the rapings, the abductions. People are fleeing across the border to Chad, but there is a fighting there too. Attacks on humanitarian workers are frequent. It has become more and more difficult to get aid to people living without hope in refugee camps. That's the quick snapshot. But I want to tell you briefly how I see this picture. It's a case study in complexity. Peacekeeping is part of the equation. We need peace process as well. That means getting all the various factions around the table so the fighting can stop. Darfur is also about climate change. People forget how much the conflict has been exacerbated by long spell of a drought. Years ago, when the rains failed, herders and farmers began fighting over an increasingly scarce resources. If you don't deal with the issue of water in Darfur, if we don't deal with the issues of poverty and disease and development and the other factors at the root of the, this conflict, then there is no solution at all. Let's talk more about the climate change. You have seen the pictures of melting glaciers and polar bears swimming in the warming Arctic Sea. Like many of you young people in this audience, I like to go see things for myself. So I went to Antarctica last year. Did you know that in Antarctica, ice sheet the size of Rhode Island have broken off and vanished within a matter of a few weeks. In the Andes, South America, I saw melting glaciers with my own eyes. In Brazil, I was supposed to take a boat ride, boat trip down a major tributary of the Amazon River. It had dried up. Huge areas of eastern rainforest will turn into savanna within the next couple of uh, decades. 
In Africa, I flew over Lake Chad, a body of water that supports 30 million people around the region. It has shrunken to a, to a tenth the size it used to be three decades ago. This is a big problem. It's a very alarming. No single nation can tackle this alone. However resourceful, however powerful one may be, including the United States, we cannot resolve this issue alone. It requires whole world's effort, and that's where United Nations comes in. That's what we do. We pull people together to find common solutions to our common problems. Everybody believes that this is a global challenge and requires global response. This is our planet Earth. We want to leave to future generations a more hospitable and environmentally sustainable world. The United Nations has worked to highlight the crisis. <clears throat> the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, known as IPCC, that is an international consortium of more than 2,000 scientists, shared last year's Nobel Peace Prize. They proved beyond doubt that global warming is real, the impact is real, and that humankind is the cause. We have organized meetings of leaders around the world, most recently at the December Climate Change Conference in Bali, Indonesia. Scientists tell us that it should have been yesterday that international community should have taken action yesterday. But if we act now, today, it may not be too late. So my urge is that international community must act now before it will be too late, be before we will regret. Here's what America can and must do. And it is a quintessentially American approach. That's because markets, technology, and entrepreneurship are a big part of the solution where we can find in the United States. As I see it, solving the problem of climate change is tied to the world's economic future. We've seen major transformations in the past, the Industrial Revolution, the technology revolution, our modern era of globalization. Now we are on the brink of another, an era of green economics. We are protecting the environment and fighting climate change help spur investment and boost economic growth. I have been discussing this matter with President Bush 43. And I'm encouraged that United States has been constructively engaging themselves in this global uh, response. They have taken initiative in convening major economies meeting on climate change. They have participated and they have joined the Bali roadmap last December. Without American participation last December, the world might not have been able to launch this Bali roadmap. This Bali roadmap was just the beginning and I really count on the leadership and the continued participation and leadership of the United States government. Last year, I visited Silicon Valley, and there I saw how venture capital is powering into new technologies for renewable energy and fuel efficiency. A recent report by the UN Environment Program, UNEP, estimates that investment in clean energy technology could reach $1.9 trillion, $1 trillion by 2020. In the United States, more than 5.3 million jobs were created in the environmental industry in 2005. That's 10 times the number uh, generated by the pharmaceutical industry. In Germany, more people will soon be employed in green technology than the automobile industry. Texas is renowned as an oil capital. Less well known is how much you are proud of this 
new technological wave. Austin is on the brink of becoming the premier solar manufacturing center in the United States. And many of you may have seen the front page of last weekend's New York Times describing how Texas is emerging as a world leader in wind power. Think of T. Boone Pickens, the legendary wild cattle, investing billions in a wind, wind farm. Uh, that's the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is this. Fighting global warming doesn't have to be a cost. It can be a huge economic opportunity. To make it so, we need America's help. You here in this room have to be part of the solution. United States has been sort of part of the problems. You have contributed, I think, greatest in terms of emanating green gas emissions. But United States is the country with the most innovative technology. You have the most biggest pool of finance and you have the technology and only political will. With a strong political will and leadership of the United States, I think the United States can be the solution. The world has many challenges. The list of the world's problems seems endless. Terrorism, nuclear proliferation, worldwide hunger and disease, conflict in the Middle East, global poverty. It is intolerable that one child dies of hunger every five seconds. It is intolerable that every minute a woman somewhere dies in pregnancy or in childbirth. Also every minute a young life is cut short by measles or disease we know how to prevent. In the face of such complex and seemingly overwhelming challenges, the temptation might be to throw up our hands, to give in to pessimism, and focus on our own lives. I see it differently. All these problems come to our door at the United Nations, yet I'm a resolute optimist. The key I have found is to see the interconnection between these problems. Look at Africa. Usually, we think of it as a landscape of conflict and hunger, disease and drought, HIV AIDS. But imagine if you can help local farmers to protect their communities or help them have clean water. Then they will produce more food, children with enough food can grow and learn with proper nourishment. Everyone is less prone to disease. People can work. Uh, pretty soon family incomes go up. Children start going to school. Societies become more productive and whole again. We need now accept hunger and poverty. That is why I am putting renewed energy into the Millennium Development Goals our worldwide effort to reduce poverty by half by the year 2015. In 2000, the world leaders gathered at the United Nations and they agreed and they set a goal that by 2015, we must eradicate all this hunger. We must help people cured from all these preventable uh, diseases. And we must provide reasonable educational opportunities to the people. By tackling these fundamental problems, we promote security. Dealing with one problem, once you see the interconnections, can be the way to solving others. Economic development is the key to everything. That's why we need, again, a strong United Nations, a United Nations that works and we need a United Nations that moves in full partnership with the United States. Because in my view, the world needs US leadership. 
Little can be achieved without it. You young people in this room, I say this most of all uh, to you. And because we need a strong United Nations, we need to change the United Nations. Since day one of my office, I have been working to shake up the bureaucracy to make it more nimble and adapt to our fast-paced world. The United Nations Charter calls for the highest standards of efficiency, competence, and integrity. I take these words to heart, and I'm working for a culture of ethics and accountability at the United Nations to show that we are answerable to all countries and all people around the world. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we all know the value of leadership and sound judgment. We all recognize how fast our world is changing and the premium that places on engagement and partnership. As Secretary General of the United Nations, I am fully committed to achieve these goals with you. And thank you very much, therefore, for your support, past and future. And thank you very much for your kind of attention. I'll be very happy to engage in dialogue with you this evening. Thank you. Well, Mr. Secretary, I want to once again thank you for taking the time to be with us here tonight and to thank you for that very comprehensive and informative statement on the role of the United Nations. But we do have a number of questions that the audience has submitted as they were coming into the auditorium. So if, with your permission, I'd like to address some of those questions to you now. Um, we are all aware of the AIDS epidemic, of the scourge of poverty around the world. And the first question that we have is, how would you rate or how would you look at the importance of the development programs that the UN operates? Uh, this year, we are going through a midpoint year of uh, Millennium Development Goals by 2015. Uh, this is a firm commitment of the international community by world leaders, including President of the United States. We must realize these goals. For that uh, possible, uh, developed and developing worlds should work together. Unfortunately, there are many uh, skeptical uh, questions are raised uh, whether these goals are achievable. And there are many countries, particularly when you go to Africa, uh, when sub-Saharan countries, we cannot find even a single country who is on track. Many countries have been making progress, but still we need to have all these countries on track so that whole world can claim by 2015 we will be able to achieve these goals. Now, this year, the Millennium Development Goal will be one of the two prior, top priorities of my mandate. I'm going to convene a high-level meetings, a summit level meeting in September, uh, so that the world leader, leaders can rededicate and recommit themselves and to galvanize a political will. We have resources. Only lacking is political will, how we can provide necessary uh, resources to developing countries. March 10th, uh, next month, I'm going to convene a Millennium Africa Steering Group. The focus should be on Africa. Therefore, I have invited the international financial presidents like the World Bank President, IMF, African Development Bank, and OECD, and major donors. I'm going to convene a very important meeting. I'm going to pro make some concrete 
recommendation, uh, recommendations okay. to that. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, Kosovo has been in the news recently, obviously, with the Declaration of, Independ of Independence, and um, we've all been reading about what's been going on. And some of our attendees here tonight would like to know what do you envisage the role of the UN being in the Kosovo situation? United Nations will continue to exercise its authority and mandate in accordance with the Security Council Resolution 1244. The first and foremost priority for me as the Secretary General is to preserve peace and stability in the region in Kosovo and all its uh, West Balkan area. Now, the Kosovo has declared independence uh, about two weeks ago, and there has been a very violent uh, demonstrations. We are very much concerned about all this continuing violence. I would like to urge all the parties concerned, uh, first of all, to refrain from exercising all this into a violent uh, means. So far, United Nations has been able to uh, manage all this uh, situation to a relatively uh, calm uh, situation. We will continue to do that. Uh, I have been very closely consulting with the member states, particularly Security Council, on this issue, uh, so that, uh, as Secretary General, as mandated by the Security Council, mm -hmm. we'll be able to resolve this issue uh, harmoniously without any further uh, violence uh, erupting. Of course, it will be uh, very difficult. It will be a very complex uh, process, mm -hmm. but we need uh, wisdom and concerted efforts by all the uh, countries, uh, parties very concerned good. this. Very yeah. good, very good, thank you. Um, another area of the world that's in the news, and you touched upon this in your comments uh, this evening, is Sudan. And one of our guests would like to know, do you think that the UN can actually bring peace to Sudan? The, the situation in Darfur has been uh, one of my top priorities since uh, day one, uh, January last year. I think we have, I have made some uh, credible uh, progress uh, in the situation in Darfur. During the last five years, the international community and particularly people in Darfur uh, region have suffered and too much and the international community has waited too long. Now with the hybrid operation now being deployed, uh, I'm going to ex accelerate this uh, process of deployment of uh, African Union and United Nations uh, hybrid operation to the full extent of 26,000 as soon as possible. Uh, these deployments should have done, should have been completed by uh, early January. But so far, because of all uh, difficult uh, security as well as the political problems, we have not been able to do that. I met the President Bashir of Sudan and foreign minister, and we have now a firm agreement. We have agreed on a sort of a timetable. As I said in my brief uh, remarks, more important thing would be political process. However effective these military operations may be, without the political process, political solution, we cannot expect a robust and effective uh, military peacekeeping operations in there. Therefore, I'm also accelerating uh, this uh, political process. There is another uh, issue between South and North Sudan. And this uh, comprehensive uh, peace agreement should also be implemented as soon as possible. United States has been taking leadership role together with the United States, uh, United Nations. Uh, two weeks ago when I visited uh, President Bush 43, we had the in-depth uh, discussions on this matter. And I think that we are moving toward the right direction. Yeah, right direction, yes. Very good. As you are aware, Mr. Secretary, the United States in the, is in the midst of a presidential uh, primary season and an election coming up pretty soon. And in November, the United States will have a new president-elect. So I have one last question. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so this will be your last question. What do you see as the most important issue facing the next president of the United States? <laughs> 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 
first of all, I'm not a candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sergeant, you know what they say in the press corps, they say it's the last question that always gets you into trouble, so be careful. <laughs> you should know that uh, this presidential campaign process is the subject of attention worldwide, not only American citizens. Uh, that is because American leadership is uh, very important, not only in your domestic politics, but in uh, world politics, particularly when it comes to peace and security, human rights, and development issues. America has been playing leadership role together with the United Nations. Therefore, as Secretary General, I'm also very much interested, and I've been very closely monitoring and watching <laughs> TV debates. <laughs> as far as I, as I can tell you as of today, I'm pretty confident that whoever may be elected by the wish of the American citizens, I'll be able to work very closely with the future president of the United States. <laughs> and again, I need a very strong American leadership in all the matters uh, of, the, uh, of the world. As I have emphasized, stronger partnership between the United Nations and the United States is mutually beneficial for the United Nations, United States, and for the whole world. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you very much.